so much, ladies, for singing that song. All right, well, let's take our Bibles now and turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, if you'll find your way there. And some handouts are going out there. Oh, thank you, Faith. Appreciate that. Uh, I do have some of these handouts. These have been on the website, actually, for quite some time. This message I intended to preach uh, quite some time ago. And uh, so we'll pick it up now as best we can. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, as we continue our series uh, through the book of Hebrews. Of course, I've had a lot longer to prepare for this message now. Uh, so, <laughs> so the question is, am I going to get through all nine verses? I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a great encouragement to be back uh, teaching and preaching again. Uh, I appreciated last Sunday's message and I thought it was very fitting as Pastor David was preaching about the church and, uh, and how we need to, to continue on and know that the church will prevail. Wasn't that a fantastic message? And, uh, and that's true. And, and then that song uh, that we just heard, uh, the power of the church is the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so we will uh, church on. If you got my email uh, that was uh, something that Christine said to me. Let's just stay calm and church on. I thought, yeah, that's a good thought right there. Let's church on. And, and so that's what we're going to do here. And, uh, and what do we need here? We need God's Word. And so let's look at it together. Hebrews chapter 5. I'll read the first uh, nine verses, and uh, then we'll jump into this passage together. Chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but, uh, that said unto, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would use these holy words in our hearts and lives today. We pray that you would indeed send your Holy Spirit, convict us where we need conviction, give us that encouragement where we need that. Lord, do that work. Draw us close to yourself. Show us yourself in the pages of Scripture. May we magnify you. May we respond in worship. And We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this, uh, this book of Hebrews has been quite the study for us, and uh, it's not been easy. There are some passages uh, that we've been studying through that, uh, I, I got to say, the, the small group Bible studies that are meeting midweek, uh, you've had good opportunities to really kind of get into some stuff and dig in a little bit and discuss it and study it, and, and that's exciting. I praise the Lord for that. Uh, in many ways, the, the Sunday morning sermon is kind of a launching pad for you so that you can continue to dig in and learn from God's Word because that's what we need. And, and here we're seeing in Hebrews that Jesus is the Savior. He's the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And He is a human being as well. And we're seeing how because He is both God and human, He fits perfectly his role. And, and we saw in the beginning of chapter 4 how he is an apostle. He's an apostle for us. That is, he speaks 
to humans on the behalf of God. So what God wants us to know, Jesus tells us, and, and he reveals the Father to us. So he speaks for God. But now we're looking at and exploring this thought uh, in, the, in the last couple of verses of chapter 4 and now into chapter 5, how he is also our high priest. And so in that role, he speaks on the behalf of human beings to a God, the, the perfect and adequate uh, mediator between the two who are uh, at, at extreme ends. You've got sinful man and you've got holy God and Jesus is the perfect one that stands between the two. And so we're exploring that thought now, how Jesus represents human beings and speaks for sinful human beings to a holy God. And we're seeing that role here in chapter 5. And uh, look with me there at verse 1. In discussing how Jesus fills this role, first, uh, we, the, the, uh, the writer of Hebrews explores what it is that a priest does. And so we see that in verse 1. For every high priest is taken from among men, is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Uh, a high priest has this incredible responsibility to be a go-between, and, uh, and he, is to, uh, he is ordained and set aside for that special purpose of representing humans to God. And it says here that the high priest was taken from among men. And there's a reason for that. The high priest, the one who represents people to God, has got to be one of the, the peoples. <laughs> okay, He's got to be a human. If he's going to represent adequately human beings, then he's got to be a human. And so as the... Uh, as the People would have been exploring this, this thought, is Jesus truly uh, this Messiah? Is he our Savior? Uh, they would have been comparing all of this new religion of Christianity to their old religion of Judaism. And as they explored Judaism, they're thinking, well, wait a minute, uh, we've got to have a priest. There was something that they understood about God, and that was that God is incredibly holy and that we are not, and we need someone to be a mediator. We've got to have someone who can go between the two. You don't just approach God in any way you want. You, you don't just walk up to the, to the throne of grace and say, hey, I'm here and I need something. Well, no, we can approach boldly, but only because we have a high priest. We've got to have a mediator. And it's very important, that, and the Jews would have understood this. And so he explains to them, well, let's think about this role of this priest, this mediator. He's, he's taken from among men uh, so that he can relate to them and represent them adequately. And he is ordained, he's set aside, he is given specifically the responsibility of serving in this role in the things pertaining to God. And so this high priest is one who takes care of spiritual things for the people, and, and is that go-between to that spirit, that great spirit, the Holy Spirit, God the Father himself. Now, how does he do this? The end of that verse, he says that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. How do you approach this holy God who is so clean and so perfect in everything that he is. How do you, a sinful human being, yeah, remember that attitude that you had this morning? Do you remember that sin that you committed yesterday? Do you remember this week how you struggled over and over again with the same problems and you think you're just going to go talk to God? Wait a minute. There's got to be there's got to be a way to approach this holy God, and it is through sacrifices, it is through gifts. And the, and the Jewish people understood that. It was the high priest that would take that gift, that sacrifice, that animal, blood sacrifice. And that, that animal, though it did not deserve to die, would have to die. Why? So that you could talk to God. Wow. Do you realize what it costs 
just for you to pray. Just for you to talk to God. It costs a lot. It costs the life of the eternal Son of God. It's a blood sacrifice. And the priest had that responsibility for that blood sacrifice just so that the people could talk to God. And it wasn't anybody that could offer that sacrifice. You don't just offer the sacrifice any way you want to. Of course, the children of Israel would have understood that, and you and I can understand that if we go clear back and just think about Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, here are two brothers, two, two sons of Adam, and, and these two brothers want to approach God, and there was a way designed for them to do that. It was through a blood sacrifice. Abel understood that, and he offered in the way that God asked. But Cain thought, I'm just going to give what I have and what I want to do. I'm going to do my best for him, and hopefully that's good enough. But it's not. It's not good enough. It has to be the way that God designs. And so the priest was the one who had the knowledge of what God designed in order for you to worship. Now we're in, in, in such an incredible place today where we can take the Bible and we can know for ourselves and we have a relationship with Jesus Christ and so that we as individuals do not have to be ignorant as to how God wants us to approach him. We know how that is because of the pages of scripture. But you think about it, the children of Israel didn't have a Bible that they could just look it up. And so they didn't know. How do we approach this holy God? What do we do? I don't know. Go ask the priest because he knows. And he did. Because he was taught, he was instructed, he knew what God required. And so the people would go to the priest and say, I've got a problem. I need to get right with God. What do I do? And the priest would say, well, what's your situation? And he'd explain it and say, okay, well, here it is. This is what the law says. This is what you need to do. And the priest had the knowledge for that. They couldn't just approach God in any way they wanted to. And neither can you. You've got to go the way that God demands. And so the priest had this responsibility of offering both gifts and sacrifices for sins. You know, and I think about our great need for a mediator. I'm reminded of several different passages. And, uh, and these, I do not believe, are in your notes. And so this is free. Uh, Let's look together at Isaiah chapter 6, one of my favorite passages, and, uh, and some of you know exactly what this passage is because it's your favorites as well. Isaiah chapter 6 is where Isaiah is given this incredible privilege of approaching the throne room of God, and he is allowed to view this incredible throne room of God. Isaiah chapter 6, look at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. <clears throat> Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Now, Isaiah, in seeing this incredible sight, realizes that he is out of place. He is... He has been allowed to go somewhere that he does not belong. And I want you to think about that. Because apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, you do not belong in the holy presence of God. You don't belong there. But it is that same holy God that grants you access to himself by the sacrifice of his son. But you'll never appreciate that sacrifice if you don't first understand you don't belong. You just don't belong there in the presence of a holy God. 
What was Isaiah's response in verse 5? Then said, I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He broke down. He didn't know what to do. He, he knew he was as good as dead in the presence of God. He knew he didn't belong there, and so he humbled himself. And I, can't, I can just imagine that he, he must have fallen down on his face before God, crying out, I am unclean. I do not deserve to be here. What happens? Verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, and having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. The only way that Isaiah could continue in that place was through a sacrifice. And, the, and the, that coal from off the altar represented that blood sacrifice. And so it was through the cleansing of that sacrifice that he could continue there in the presence of God. He needed someone to help him. Isaiah was not going to go marching up there and grab a live coal off the, off the altar and do something for himself. He wasn't going to do that because he didn't belong there in the first place. It took an angel. It took someone to act for him, to help him in that setting. You think about that. You don't just approach God. You don't just charge in and do what you want to do. You have got to have help. You've got to have a go-between. You've got to have a mediator. And, uh, and Isaiah had that in that sense there, that mediator uh, that helped him in that time. Look with me at Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, I, I find it a similar situation to some degree. Jesus is with his uh, special three, his inner three disciples here, and he's on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. In verse 1 of Matthew 17, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, uh, that bringeth up, up into a higher, uh, high mountain apart and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here the three, tab tab three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. In that moment, they realized, Whoa, wait a minute. We don't just approach God the way that we think we ought to. I know what we ought to do, Peter says. I, I, got, a, I got a good idea. This is how we can worship. I'll make a tabernacle here and another one over here and another one over here. And, and we'll worship God this way. And God says, shut up. <laughs> you know, maybe not quite like that. But he says, listen to my son. Listen to my son. And, and immediately Peter and, and the other two realize, oh boy, we don't belong here. They fell on their faces. They were sore afraid as they ought to have been. And as you and I ought to be in the presence of a holy God, we ought to be afraid because we don't belong there. What happened? Well, Jesus came, verse 7, Jesus came and touched them and said, arise, arise. And be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. You see, there was a go-between. They didn't know what to do. And in fact, they couldn't do anything. Until Jesus came. And he touched them. And Jesus, in a sense, took them by the hand and said, Let me show you. Let me help you. This is how you can know God. Aren't you thankful today? that Jesus is your mediator? 
that even though you are a sinful human being, that you can approach God, that you can pray to God, you can talk to Him, you can worship Him, and it's all because Jesus took your hand. It's all because Jesus died for your sins. Jesus became your mediator. Do you, do you see and understand that there is no worship that takes place in this auditorium or anywhere unless Jesus is a part of it? It has to be through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. The only way. What a shame that churches today try to worship God. Never mention Jesus. They never mention the blood of Jesus Christ. How do they, how do they assume they can worship God if they don't believe in him? It is through Jesus Christ that we approach this holy God. And so back in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1, you see, every high priest is taken from among men, is ordained for men, that is in the place of of men to represent men in the things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins this go between is so important because he has the know-how to approach God he knows what to do and he is authorized to do it and so let us cling to Jesus our high priest but verse 2 continues in explaining now uh, the, the job of the priest, uh, he continues to explain why this priest must be from among men. Verse 2, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer sins. And as they explore this this. Uh, uh, this job of the high priest, uh, they're reminded that, yes, he's a human being, at least Aaron was, and, and the, the priests of the Levitical system were human beings, and so they were also sinners. And because they were sinners and because they were humans, they were also compassionate to other sinners. And that's important. Now, we know that Jesus is no sinner, in fact, we explored that thought several weeks ago. Uh, if you look back at chapter 4, verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus never sinned. He's not in the category of sinners, but he's in the category of humans. Because he's a human, he can show great compassion because he's felt the things, the human passions that we feel. And so he can relate in that way. But, but he's different than the priesthood of Aaron because he didn't have to offer sacrifice for himself. And it's a good thing too. Because it was his own blood that he offered. If he offered his own blood for himself, then how could it be good for us? It couldn't be. It wouldn't be. And so he had to be the perfect sinless lamb, spotless lamb, so that the blood that he offered on the cross of Calvary would not be making atonement for his own sins, but for your sins and for my sins. Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. So he's, he's different, but he's very qualified, more so than any other human being that could attempt and so here the, the priesthood typically has to offer for their own sins because they are sinners. And so uh, in, your, in your notes, you'll be exploring some other passages that show Aaron offering for himself and offering for the people. And, and that's what he would have to do all the time, offer for himself and then offer for the people. And he knew how to do it, and he was the one designated to do it. Offered for himself and offered for the people. But part of that... Uh, was the design of that was, was so that he would be compassionate on those that were, as we see in verse 2, ignorant or out of the way. Two categories here of sin that seem to, uh, to uh, show themselves in this verse. First, on those that are ignorant. Did you know that if you commit sin in ignorance, that is, if you sin against a holy God and don't even know you do it, you are still accountable for it. You, you may not even know that you've sinned, but you still deserve the death penalty because of it. 
You are accountable to a holy God because of that. And so that's why the, the, the people needed a priest who understood that and who was compassionate to others. So they'd, they'd come to him and he'd say, you've got some other problems going on. Do you know this? You know, you're not approaching God the right way. And you've got this issue as well and that issue as well. We need to offer sacrifices for that too. And perhaps the people are thinking, well, wait a minute. I didn't know that was a problem. Oh, yeah, it is. It is a problem. And this is, this is something that needs to be taken care of. You know, there, there are billions of people on this planet that commit sin against a holy God and don't even know they do it. Or they're, they're not, they don't see it as a big problem, at least. In many ways, they're very ignorant. That's why we send missionaries around the world to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and to help them understand you are a sinner. You need a mediator. You need a savior. You need a high priest. And many people don't even understand that. You know, sometimes we, uh, we hear from uh, scientists and, and uh, anthropologists and, and uh, they say, well, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't interrupt these, these cultures out there in the bush. You know, they're, they're so happy. They're so, they're so wonderful just doing things in the way that they know to. No, they aren't. They're killing themselves and each other. And they've, they've developed some kind of system that isn't working. And they don't realize how they're sinning against a holy God. They need someone. They need a missionary to go and share with them the truth of the gospel. They need to be confronted with the, with the Bible and with their own sin. They need to see it because they're still accountable for it. You say, well, that's not fair. How could God punish somebody who's sinned against him and they don't even know they sinned against him? Because they've got the creation. The Bible tells us in, in Romans chapter 1 and 2, they are accountable to God. They are guilty before him because they can look around and see this incredible creation. They can see this world and they must know there is a God. And then they have their own conscience on their inside telling them you are wrong, you are wrong, you are wrong. They know they're wrong. They are guilty before God. They need someone to tell them the truth. Sin committed in ignorance is still sin. And it deserves a death penalty. Wow. And so this high priest would have compassion on someone who ignorantly violated God's law. But not just ignorantly. Also on them that are out of the way. Say, well, Pastor Joel... I know what the Bible teaches. I'm not ignorant in my sin. I know what I do is wrong. Is there hope for me? Yes, praise God, there is. You may be out of the way. You may have been deceived by the devil, by the world around you, by your own flesh. You may have been deceived, but you are still held accountable to God for that sin. And you might have stepped out of the way, knowingly even. And you committed sin against God and you knew it was wrong, but yet you committed that sin. Is there help for you? There is. There is a high priest who is compassionate to even those that are out of the way. And aren't you thankful for that? He said, that's why I keep coming back, Pastor Joel, because I was out of the way this week, and I needed to come back. You know, in every moment of every day, we, we make those decisions to sin and turn against God, and we step out of the way. We can come back to him. And we've got a priest who is compassionate to us. And Jesus says, I know. I know the feelings that you've had. I, I understand the temptations. I understand it. I've felt it, and I can be that go-between for you. And so he is compassionate to us. There seems to be a sin that is not mentioned in this verse, and there's quite a discussion on this among theologians. What about the high-handed, willing sin? Well, the reality is a person who is sinning against God with a high hand, with such rebellion, 
You would have no desire to be reconciled to God in the first place. They don't want him. And so there's no sacrifice for that. Because they're not asking for a sacrifice for that. They don't want it. But they will still face the penalty for that sin. In fact, the Bible tells us in the Levitical system that those that committed that egregious, high-handed, rebellious sin against God were to be cast out. They could no longer be with the people of God. And you know, that is renewed even in the New Testament. Because as church saints, if, if you decide to rebel against God, there's a big question of whether or not you were saved in the beginning anyway. But when you rebel against a holy God, you know it is the responsibility of the church to set you outside because you don't want a sacrifice for your sins. You don't want reconciliation for your sins. That seems to be a sin not mentioned here in verse, tw- in verse 2. Because God has ordained that, that this high priest would be the mediator for those who want it. Do you want forgiveness? Do you want to be reconciled to a holy God? Do you want to get that sin taken care of and out of the way? Then return to the high priest. And let his blood sacrifice be enough for you. This high priest, this humanly high priest, Aaron and his sons, were compassed with infirmity, weakness, human frailty. They knew that they were they were prone to stepping out of the way. And so they would, be, they would have compassion on those that would come again and again and again and again for the same sins, perhaps. They would have compassion on them and help them to offer the sacrifices and offer for them so that they could be restored yet again to the fellowship of God. Well, our Savior, while he is not a sinner, he understands those passions that we have. And while he is not a sinner, he was certainly and still is a human being. And as a human being, he understands the frailty of human beings and the infirmities of human beings. And so when you go back to God again and again and again for the same sins, it would seem. And and by the way, if that's a problem for you, it's time to start growing in your faith and getting over that. But the reality is God's grace doesn't run out. And because Jesus understands that frailty, he offers that sacrifice to God. That, that he, he offers that, that uh, office of priesthood yet again for you on your behalf. Again and again. Because he understands that infirmity. Well, now let's look at verse number 4. We've, we've touched on verse 3 by the reason here of ought uh, As for the people, so also for himself to offer sins. That's speaking to Aaron and his sons, not to Jesus. But in verse 4, here's a second thing about a priesthood. Uh, First, they had to be compassionate. Secondly, they had to be called. Verse 4, no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. This is another problem that human beings have. They assume that they can approach God in any way that they want. And then they take on themselves some honor of earning favor in God's eyes. And humans do this all the time. If I do all these good things, if I get baptized, join the church, if I give money in the offering plate, if I'm kind to my neighbor, if I forgive my spouse, if I, and you fill in the blank, if I do these things, then God will smile at me and I will have earned an audience with him. And so humans think that they can take on themselves the great honor of being a priest, and they cannot. You cannot take that honor for yourself. It is a calling. It is something that only God can designate. And so God designated 
Aaron and his sons to be that priesthood for the people. Nobody else could do it. I want you to look with me at Numbers chapter 17. Numbers chapter 17. Now, in, in your notes, you're going to be looking at Numbers chapter 16. And, and that's a great uh, passage. And so don't skimp on that, okay, when you go home. Uh, but Numbers chapter 17, I want you to look at here, which uh, it's amazing. I mean, it comes right on the tails of chapter 16. So you'll see how that'll flow together. But look at Numbers 17. Verse number one, <clears throat> the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking of the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod. This is a time when everybody has a rod. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know what that would translate to today, maybe... Uh, everybody's cell phone. No, <laughs> anyway, I'm just kidding. Okay, so every man, his rod, write the name on that rod. Twelve of them, one for each of the tribes. Thou shalt write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi, and one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. It says, okay, specifically Levi, we're going to write Aaron's name on that rod. And thou shalt lay them up, in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel whereby they murmur against you. Moses spake unto the children of Israel and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece for each prince one according to their father's houses even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of the witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went in the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt uh, quite take away their murmurings from me that they die, that they die not. Uh, there's no question here that God made a choice. It was God's choice who would be the priest. It wasn't man's choice. This is not a democracy. The children of Israel didn't all get together and say, hey, who do we think is the best, the brightest? Who do we think would serve in this role the way that we think they ought to serve in this role? Now, who can we elect to this position? And if they don't do what we say, boy, we're going to choose somebody else. Who is it? No, I don't think so. You don't get that choice. God made that choice. And so they brought out Aaron's rod. Can you imagine what that must have looked like? Budding, even producing almonds on that rod. Wow, I mean, maybe it would have kind of been heavy to carry out. I don't know. But they look at the rod. There it is. There's Aaron's name. It says his name right there. There's no question. God chose Aaron. Uh, nobody chooses it for themselves. They tried to. The children of Israel tried to. Look at 1 Kings chapter 12. And I know it's 1159. I'm going to wrap it up here. 1 Kings chapter 12. In 1 Kings chapter 12, we have the history of the children of Israel. And uh, after David was king, after his son Solomon was king, then there was a civil war. And the 12 tribes split up. And there were 10 tribes in the north and two in the south. And there became two kingly lines. And here in this passage, Jeroboam is the king of the northern tribes. And Jeroboam realizes we've got a problem because God says 
that the only way we can worship him is if we go to Jerusalem to do it. Well, Jerusalem is the capital city of the southern tribes, and I don't want my people going to the capital city of those southern tribes. We've got to change our religious system, and so that's exactly what Jeroboam did. He chooses two cities for, uh, his, of his own liking, uh, but it gets worse. He even chooses his own priesthood. Look with me at verse 28. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, made him ruler over the charge of the house of Joseph. I'm not in chapter 12. You are, but I'm not. Let me go back there. Okay, that was 11, if anybody's wondering. Okay, chapter 12 now, verse 28. <laughs> Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. He took that responsibility for himself and he said, you know what? I'm going to choose who's going to be the high priest. And he chose whoever he wanted to. Made a democracy out of something that should have been a theocracy. That caused problems for the nation of Israel from that time forward. All the way up to the time of Jesus, the Samaritans were despised because of Jeroboam's decision. You know, we can't just choose who we want to represent us. You don't just choose anybody you want. That's right. We're going to choose Peter, and he's going to choose uh, the, the remaining popes after that. I don't think so. No. No, God makes the choice, and his choice is Jesus. Yes, he chose Aaron for the nation of Israel. But as we will see, as we continue studying this passage in Hebrews 5, his choice is Jesus. Jesus is our high priest. Nobody takes that decision on themselves. It's a high calling. When, when Peter and John heard the voice of God on the Mount of Transfiguration, God said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. That's who's who God has chosen. I wonder, have you submitted to the high priest, Jesus Christ, the one that God chose? Or are you still looking elsewhere for something or someone else, or even for yourself? Maybe you think, I can be my own priest. No, no, you need Jesus. You need a mediator. You need the one who God has called. Well, next time we'll pick it up here and continue uh, so we study through this and see how Jesus fits the bill perfectly, perfectly. Our Father, we thank you for making that choice. We thank you for helping us to understand our need for a mediator, a priest. And we are desperate to know you and to speak with you and to interact with you. And we know that the only way we can do that is through the choice that you've made, Jesus Christ, the chosen one, the elect one. God, I thank you. I thank you for revealing to us who he is. And I pray now that you would help us to cling to this, this Savior, this high priest, Jesus. And may we be determined to help others to know him. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.